Hey, I don't think I have that much of an accent. <laughs> I do say y'all, though. It's too useful a, a pronoun. Um, so it's my pleasure to be moderating this discussion tonight. And um, we have two hugely interesting speakers here. And I will briefly introduce them. Um, tonight's guests, as you know, are two very accomplished McGillians. If you're paying attention to the news these days, and you know how, how can you avoid it, even in Canada, um, actually, it's the same being in Canada as it was living in Texas in terms of paying attention to the news in the United States. You might be getting the impression that the world is in a pretty awful place right now. And if you're particularly paying attention to social media, you're pretty much confirmed in that impression. Our two guests today may wish to paint a bit of a different picture of the state of our world how we've arrived here and what we can do about it, though I understand they may have slightly different perspectives on that issue. Before our first guest was a world leading authority on language and the mind, Steven Pinker spent his early days in Montreal. He told the Montreal Gazette recently that he grew up in an Anglophone Jewish Montreal household and that his mother went to Hebrew school with none other than Leonard Cohen and his father knew Mordecai Richler. After graduating from McGill's psychology department, he received his PhD from Harvard. Today, he is an experimental psychologist and the Johnston family professor in the Department of Psychology at Harvard, an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, a humanist of the year, and one of Foreign Policy Magazine's world's top 100 public intellectuals. Tonight, he'll be discussing some of the key elements of his latest book, his 10th, as a matter of fact, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress, in which he defends the ideal that we need to address our problems head on to continue humanity's progress. We are also enjoy, uh, joined by another big ideas person, McGill's own Jennifer Welch, a prominent international relations scholar who joined the university this year. Welcome. And come to my office. <laughs> um, I have the best painting in the university. Anyway, OK. Former special advisor to the UN Secretary General, Professor Welch, delivered the 2016 CBC Massey Lecture entitled The Return of History, exploring whether we have failed to create a global formula for lasting peace and social equity. Professor Welsh carved out an international reputation as a respected thinker on the history and practice of humanitarian intervention during her years as a professor at the European University Institute and the University of Oxford. At McGill, she holds a joint appointment between the Department of Political Science and the new Max Bell School of Public Policy and serves as director of the Center for International Peace and Security Studies. She's teaching the policymakers of tomorrow at what couldn't be a more crucial time. Thank you so much, both of you, for engaging us in this discussion. So the rules of the game are going to be very simple here. I'm going to start off with a question, and then I'm going to back off and let the interesting people speak on these issues. So to start off, I would like to ask Steve, in today's political climate of rampant populism, please speculate on the health of the rules-based international liberal order. So the, the um, rules-based liberal international order is a nebulous concept that I came across to as one of the explanations for a fact that very few people realize is a fact, uh, namely the decline of war, one of many declines of violence that I wrote about in my book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, and indeed one of the many forms of quantifiable human progress that I wrote about in Enlightenment Now, 
uh, a fact that are, is hard to appreciate if your view of the world comes from, from journalism, from news sites, uh, because uh, of a combination of the way we assess the world, that is the way that the human brain assess risk, danger, probability, frequency, uh, and the view of the world that you get from the news. Now, the uh, what a basic principle of cognitive psychology, my own field, is that we tend to uh, assess a probability via a mental shortcut, sometimes called the availability heuristic, which is the more uh, readily available an image or a narrative is in, uh, in memory or imagination, the more common we think it is. So we're afraid of shark attacks and, and terrorist attacks and all these things that kill very few people. We're not afraid of texting while driving or falling off ladders, things that kill lots of people uh, because they don't, they're, they're not in the news. Well, how does this uh, relate to uh, the rules-based liberal international order? Well, one f phenomenon in recent human history that you can't appreciate from the news is that war is in uh, decline. This may seem incredible, astonishing, uh, but if you think about it, imagine a world in which there were 50 wars going on that, say, kill a million people. Now imagine a world in which there are five wars going on that kill, say, 10,000 people. Well, if you read the papers, those worlds look identical because whatever violence there is, whatever wars there are, they'll, they'll fill the, the front page or the, the home page. And unless you count, unless you also add up the number of countries that are not at war, you have no idea what the uh, actual historical direction is. And, and when I came to this topic, something that I'm by no means trained as an expert in, but I am interested in the human mind and human behavior. One of the things I'm interested in is violence. And just almost as, a, as a, an afterthought in talking about the uh, evolved brain systems that make us likely to, uh, to um, uh, 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 enact acts of violence. Uh, I noted, well, that doesn't mean we're doomed to violence because in many measures of violence have gone down over history. So even if we do have these rather nasty impulses, we can also control them. And I mentioned that uh, rates of homicide have come down over the centuries. And then a fact that I had only recently learned about is that if you plot war deaths over time, or if you, for that matter, plot number of wars, uh, you see something that you can't appreciate from the papers, and that is that there has been a decline. Over say, about 500 years of history for which people have been adding up wars, the percentage of time that the great powers of the day, the big states and empires that can do the most damage because they have the biggest armies, percentage of time they've been at war has gone down, 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 and the big states and empires now, since 1946, have kind of stayed out of each other's faces. We just haven't had a, a great power war since the Korean War uh, 65 years ago. International wars. Country A declares war against country B. Their armies meet on the battlefield. They bomb each other's cities. Their warships um, um, chuck ordnance at each other. Those have been in decline. And even though civil wars, which are the dominant form of war today uh, showed an increase in the 60s and 70s, they've come down as well. And if you combine all the wars and just add up how many people get killed in war each year, it's a, a bit of a roller coaster, but since 1946 it's been going down, down, down. Uh, just to put a, a number uh, on the figure, in the early 1950s the rate of death of all wars across the globe was about 22 per 100,000 per year. Today it is less than 1 per 100,000 per year. Now, that's not zero. People, there's still some awful wars going on. We read about them, but we don't read, of course, about all the countries that are, are not at war, like Western Europe, which fought two new wars a year for a millennium. That went to zero after 1945. Uh, whole parts of the world, like Southeast Asia, which had horrific, bloody wars uh, through the late 1970s. There hasn't been a shooting war there since, since uh, the, the late 70s. Then with the signing of the uh, peace agreement between government of Colombia and the FARC guerrillas, the last war in the Western Hemisphere came to an end. So five-sixths of the world's surface is now free from, from war. The, uh, and the question is why? What happened? Were the same humans that we were 50 years ago, 100 years ago? What changed? So one answer to the question, and admittedly somewhat nebulous, is that the behavior in the kind of club of nations has, has changed. Uh, there are a number of 
things that get thrown into this uh, admittedly nebulous concept um, that have been credited for some of the decline in war. Uh, one of them is the spread of democracy. There is a famous hypothesis, the democratic peace theory, that democracies don't fight each other in wars. Probably an exaggeration, but uh, it depends what you count as a democracy, depends what you count as a war. But probably true, at least probabilistically, democracies are less likely to fight each other. Uh, global trade, when you have uh, countries depending on their own ability to dig stuff out of the ground and grow stuff for food, uh, that sets them in competition against each other for, for uh, land when they're autarkic in the sense of relying on their own resources. The more land, the richer you are. Um, if you replace that with a regime, a uh, global regime of easy free trade, then it becomes cheaper to buy stuff than to plunder it, and countries have less, less of an incentive to invade each other. You don't kill your customers. Uh, you don't kill your debtors. Third part of this order, a third explanation for the decline of war is um, international organizations, including but not restricted to the United Nations, both because uh, there can be uh, referees, umpires, uh, arbiters, uh, uh, armed posses that can uh, put themselves between belligerents, peacekeeping forces, and I guess our own famous Canadian Lester Pearson, I guess, deserves some of the credit for that. That's why he, one of the reasons I think he won a Nobel Peace Prize, our uh, prime minister in the 1960s. Uh, but they, even though there have been some spectacular failures of UN peacekeeping forces, on average, statistical studies, studies show that if you have a peacekeeping force, it lowers the chance that, of recidivism back into civil war compared to no peacekeeping force, holding all else constant. And then perhaps most nebulous of all, as part of this international or, order, is just the, a, kind of a, a norm that conquest is just something that civilized countries just don't do anymore, uh, partly backed up by the, the implicit norms in the community of nations in the, in the, uh, the UN, uh, and also by international law. Uh, I was, after uh, the Better Angels of Our Nature came out, I was uh, um, uh, affected by a book called The Internationalist by Scott Shapiro and Una Hathaway, which they argued that the much ridiculed uh, Paris Peace Pact of 1928, kellogg briand Pact that many of us learned to sneer at in high school history, that outlawed war, ha-ha, 1928, a lot of good that did. Uh, but so Hathaway and Shapiro argue that actually it did do good. It did took a while to come into effect, but with the formation of the United Nations, there was a momentous change in that before that, war was, as they used to say, the continuation of policy by other means. Might made right to the wit victor went the spoils, and if one country had a grievance against another, it would be perfectly fine to invade them, conquer a chunk of territory, and crucially, the international community would recognize the conquest as legitimate. With the United Nations in 1945, you couldn't do that anymore. I mean, you, you could do it, but you couldn't the world would not, uh, would not nod and, and uh, acknowledge that conquest. Uh, states were Im immortal. Borders, no matter how illogical, were kind of grandfathered in. And if you had a grievance about a border, you no longer would, would go to war to, to rectify it. You had to live with the borders uh, that existed as of 1945, with some ex obvious exceptions. Um, Israel after 1967, Russia in Crimea just five, five years ago. But Uno, uh, I'm sorry, Hathaway and Shapiro show that prior to 1928, there was a, a, 11 an, a Crimea size annexations a year for 150 years. As of 1928, that went all, uh, very close to zero. So the, uh, putting all these ideas together, this is the idea that there is a club of nations. They trade a lot with each other. Uh, they're not that uh, uh, the tariffs have been eliminated, but the general assumption is that tariffs are bad. Again, with many other aspects of the liberal rules-based international order under rather extreme threat from Donald Trump, from Putin, from, from uh, others, but this is, these are kind of the rules of the game so far, that uh, you, you don't conquer territory, uh, you support organizations like the EU, the UN, um, uh, NATO, uh, and 
dozens of other international organizations to form a kind of club in which contrary to most of human history, war is stigmatized, it's a last resort, it's something that civilized countries no longer do. And if it is indeed the, uh, the, the explanation for what's sometimes called the long peace, the decline of war, it is something that we should be concerned when it is threatened as it is uh, um, quite saliently now by the, the current regime in Washington. Jennifer. You have thoughts to this? A couple? I think the important point that comes out of, of Stephen's remarks is that it's difficult to isolate a single cause for the decline in war. We can think about a variety of factors that came together. But one of the things he highlights is the, is the institutions. Just as we think about how institutions domestically restrain behavior, foster cooperation, we can think of the same dynamic going on in the international system. We have institutions that tame the avarice of, of states. And I think it is really significant to note this decline in interstate war uh, over time. Although um, two uses of force, if we don't use the word war, because I would say sometimes states today use force but don't call it war, uh, that have had an enormous impact on the way we think about the rules-based order today were the Iraq War of 2003 and the Kosovo War of 1999. If you were to beam yourself into the Security Council chamber uh, today or a year ago and you listen to debates about whether states should become involved in certain countries or should cooperate, you would often hear the Iraq War and the Kosovo War come up in that conversation. There is still huge controversy over both of those episodes and they affected the rules-based system uh, that we have. I think what's also important to note about the rules-based international system, and I'm reluctant to call it the liberal rules-based international system because when I think about the origins of the United Nations, it was absolutely true um, that the power of the United States was pivotal in the creation of the UN system. But if you remember Roosevelt's vision, it was a vision of four policemen, that it wouldn't be just the United States that was organizing institutions for the post-1945 world. It would be other great powers as well. The institutional framework we have in the UN system is fundamentally backed up by great powers. It's not an idealistic system. And the idea of the creators of the United Nations, because they had the failure of the League of Nations in their mind, was that we had to bring the great powers into the tent we had to make them responsible for the management of international peace and security. And so that's why we have five permanent members of the Security Council. You might ask yourself, as many other states do, you know, whether it should still be those same five, uh, whether the world has changed, but they're pivotal to the system. And some of the cracks we see in the order today are as a result of the relationships among those five, uh, predominantly China, Russia, uh, and the United States. But it's also important to remember that even when um, you can have massive disagreements over a particular issue, as we saw, for example, over the Syrian civil war over the last several years, the Security Council does agree to do a significant number of things. It, for example, deploys peacekeeping forces in countries like um, Mali in the Central African Republic. But it is that great power agreement which is so crucial to it. So that's why I worry when we see two things happening. One, we see the United States as a result of populism uh, and, other, and other forces wanting to withdraw from that rules-based international system. Uh, and also when we have overt conflicts uh, between members of the Security Council, whether it be, for example, Russia and the United States over Venezuela. But we need to put these in perspective. Uh, Stephen's right, and I think it's one of the great strengths of his work. We have to take a long-term view on this. There were massive disputes in the, in the Security Council during the Cold War. Uh, we've had periods where it's been very difficult uh, for those uh, primary members, those five permanent members, 
uh, to agree. I guess I'd make two other uh, comments on this. I think our focus on war um, is right, because if we think about war in terms of its devastation on lives, it's also the context in which we see the most gross violations of human rights are in the context of war. But we also see uh, violence today that doesn't reach the threshold of a formal armed conflict. And I think in some of the data that we look at, we focus on whether there is war as the lawyers would define it, as opposed to lesser forms of conflict, asymmetric conflict between great powers and terrorist organizations, or uh, very interestingly, lethal violence in countries that, that does not reach the threshold of a formal war. So I'll give you an example of this. There, there's a study published every five years called The Global Burden of Armed Violence. And in 2015, it showed that while roughly half a million people die each year in lethal violence, only about 12% 12 12 die in formal armed conflict. The rest die in other settings. So if you look at a list in that burden of, of armed violence, you will see Syria, you will see Yemen, but you will see at the top of the list, Honduras. Guatemala, Mexico, Venezuela. These are incredibly violent countries, but not reaching the threshold of a formal armed conflict. And that's what our rules-based international system, the Security Council, can't cope with. It was designed for interstate war. Very reluctantly, it began to pronounce on civil war. But when you look at violence that doesn't reach that threshold, the Security Council is often completely paralyzed. And Venezuela is the best example of that today, where we have a country, great instability, humanitarian crisis, and our rules-based international system cannot seem to generate uh, a cooperative response. <clears throat> Yeah, one of the, uh, indeed, one of the things that you discover when you look at the statistics of war, uh, or statistics of violence, is that for all the publicity that war gets from historians and, and uh, journalists, it's everyday homicides that kill far more people. I mean, at least, it, ten, probably ten times or more. In fact, even during the, uh, the, the years of the Vietnam War in the United States, the Vietnam War killed on the American side 58,000 um, uh, Americans. Every year during the Vietnam War, uh, 40 to 50,000 people were murdered in the United States, year after year after year. Uh, and it, it still uh, it remains true that uh, homicides, and then in, in uh, regions like Central America, in fact, it's been argued that in a book called The Remnants of War by John Mueller, that the, the remaining wars, now that the old-fashioned international wars of tanks meeting on the battlefield and battleships um, attacking each other has uh, gone in abeyance, it's actually hard to distinguish the remaining civil wars from warlord activity, local mafias and gangs, uh, and that that's what, what war has become in large parts of the world. Not Syria, but certainly in, uh, in Central America and, and, and uh, large parts of uh, Africa. And indeed, ironically enough, this was kind of the way war was fought for a lot of human history, where it was hard to draw the line between mafias, gangs, warlords, on the one they used to be called knights. Um, then with the military revolution in the 16th century, you had national armies and conscription and training and so on. But the kind of ragtag but very destructive bands of gangs uh, was kind of the way war used to be fought, and we're kind of sliding back into that. And, and the, indeed, the, the zone of where the most people are killed in the world is very different from the zone in which wars take place. It is uh, Central America and Southern Africa are the homicide regions. Uh, the war region is kind of from a belt from Nigeria through the Middle East into Pakistan. So they're even diff different territories. Do you have thoughts on that, Jennifer? Yeah, I think the other, the other interesting trend we see, because in, in my work, I focus on the on the places where there still are wars, uh, and Stephen's correct that it you know it is it is a much um, smaller set of countries than we saw particularly in the era, era of decolonization. And one of the great challenges for an organization like the United Nations is how do you sustain peace? So in those countries where we've had violence, uh, 
The greatest risk factor for the recurrence of violence are the commission of crimes against populations in the course of, uh, of those wars. And how do you actually sustain peace uh, in a society that has undergone um, such horrific violence. I think of a country like South Sudan, for example. Because one of the trends the political scientists point to is that a lot of the civil conflicts we see seem to recur. You have regions of the world where they break out uh, frequently. And so there is something within the challenge of peace building that we've yet uh, to come to grips with. I do think just as we were talking at the beginning of our remarks, that institutions have something to do with this. But building institutions, new institutions, on the foundation of a very violent, a previously very violent society uh, is extremely difficult. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, or? No, I, I, I mean, it's sort of consistent with the, the, the numbers that I've looked at, including, there seem to be countries where war, crime, uh, sort of can blend into each other with gangs that become militias. And countries like Colombia, which had both a civil war and sky-high homicide rates, and then horrific political violence in the 40s and 50s that most people have forgotten, La Violencia, which actually was kind of liberal versus conservative political parties at each other's throats, killed a million people over a dozen years. Uh, and then that got replaced by the, the uh, communist militias and right-wing militias against each other and against the government. In the, also in the back, uh, and in the backdrop, a lot of drug and gang-fueled uh, homicide, often shading into um, militias and paramilitaries. So they, do, they can go together. I mean, and, and increasingly, that's what war has, seems to have devolved into. OK, I hope I'm not going too far out in this question, but I'm intrigued by um, your numbers that uh, there were 40,000 murders in the United States while there were 50, 58,000 um, soldiers killed during the Vietnam era. Turning away from traditional war into crime rates, into um, endemic issues in society, um, tell me how you feel about the progression of the human context with those sorts of issues. The human context? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, I mean, it, sounds like a, it sounds like a trick question, but it clearly isn't given the, the book that I just wrote, because a, a remarkable thing that I was not, I myself was not prepared for in looking at data on, uh, on the human condition over time is that there really does seem to see, exists this thing called progress, um, not as a mysterious force that lifts, lifts us ever upward, quite the contrary, the universe really doesn't care about us. Um, and, but uh, almost any measure of human well-being that you can be quantified and that has um, been counted over time, you see improvements. Uh, I, I came across it starting from homicide, which how, however, Horrific the rates of homicide are in countries like Mexico and Colombia. They used to be worse even there. They used to be that bad in the United States. They used to be that bad in medieval Europe. So homicide has gone down. War has gone down more recently, just since really only since 1940, uh, 45. Um, but uh, violence against women down, violence against uh, children, institutional forms of violence from human sacrifice to slavery to burning heretics to capital punishment and corporal punishment all, all um, down. And then expanding from violence to other measures of human well-being, uh, we see a drastic reduction in extreme poverty, which used to probably characterize 90% of the world's population a couple of centuries ago. Now it's less than 10%. Uh, illiteracy, uh, the ability to read and write, used to be a, a perquisite of a privileged few. Now 90% of the world's population under the age of 25 can, can uh, read and write. Um, leisure time, the amount of leisure time has doubled from, from an era in which people would work 60 hours a week and, and spend 60 hours a week on uh, housework, both of which have gone down. Uh, and just me happiness has gone up in a majority of countries over the last 40 years. So oddly enough, uh, what you, what might 
one might think to be a, a kind of romantic, optimistic, utopian view of the human condition, turns out to be something you discover when you just look at numbers. And you tend not to look at numbers because that's not what journalism is about. Journalism is about events. And uh, a lot of the great things that happen to humans are things that don't happen at all, like countries that don't have famines or epidemics or wars or terrorist attacks, and they're just not in the news because nothing happens. But there are more and more countries like that, and more and more people like that who live in boring prosperity and peace and... Uh, uh, and we should be grateful that, that so much of the world has, got, has gotten so boring. Jennifer. I, I do think part of it is, it is related to the information uh, that we're presented with. And I think part of it is due uh, as well um, to this question of our own contemporary politics. The, I think the question of progress that you speak about in your book is today in 2019 or, or last year in 2018 very caught up in the angst about the health of democracy uh, and the staying power of liberal democracy. And I think here there are some interesting trends. Stephen talks about some of these in his book. We've seen a gradual rise uh, over time in the number of democratic states across the world. Uh, but we also know, if we look at history, that there can be spurts and retrenchment uh, in democracy. We had growth in the early part of the 20th century, and then we moved backwards again uh, in the interwar period. And today, depends again on the numbers that you look at, if you were to consult an organization like Freedom House, you would see that political liberties, uh, political freedom and civil liberties are in the majority uh, of cases that they look at, there's been a net decline in political liberties across the world. And we also know from our own polities that there is great angst about the health of liberal democracy. And I think part of the reluctance, in a sense, to sometimes embrace progress, uh, and I find this when I, when I read um, Stephen's work, is that I worry about complacency. Uh, that's not what he counsels, but I think it's something that my generation um, and early in our generations are guilty of with respect to liberal democracy. Liberal democracy was a very, uh, uh, a prize that was won through hard work, through struggle, through the struggle of many generations. And it still requires struggle, and it requires a very, very passionate defense. And yet, we don't see that. Uh, sufficiently. And so I think some of the angst and the skepticism of, about progress, I think, is, inf is partly infused by the political malaise uh, that we're living in. Uh, certainly, and I, I, I couldn't agree more about the need for a defense of the liberal world, world order and, and of, I guess, what you could call small l liberalism in the broadest sense, an emphasis on the rights of the individual, on human well being, as opposed to, say, national glory. Uh, or, or struggle as a force for health and invigoration and old, kind of old ideas about war being actually healthy for humans as opposed to the current attitude of it being um, uh, uh, revolting and primitive and dangerous. Uh, so I, I certainly agree about the need for, uh, for the defense and in fact that, that kind of why I wrote Enlightenment Now is that I thought that, that uh, the uh, forces toward progress that we can neglect at our peril needed a, a defense precisely because so many people were unaware that they had actually delivered anything of value like something close to world peace or at least a decline of war and a decline of poverty and a de decline of illiteracy. When pe my, my argument is uh, uh, we must not be complacent, absolutely. These things don't happen but for, for human effort, for advocacy. Uh, there, but there is, a, uh, I think, a, a complementary danger in failing to appreciate the progress that, that we have made, namely fatalism or, and, and radicalism, cynicism, uh, that nothing, uh, nothing could be worse than what we have now, so let's just tear down the institutions uh, because anything that rises out of the ashes is bound to be better than, than what we have now. And I think it's essential that we, we be reminded that however bad things are now, they used to be a lot worse. <laughs> 
and they could get a lot worse, again, as you point out, uh, if we don't defend the very forces that have delivered the, the benefits that we uh, don't appreciate from the papers, but we do appreciate when we, when we look at, uh, at data. Would you like to comment? And then we'll move on to some Q&A to involve all of you. Let's okay. Turn to the okay. Um, we do have some time for questions. Actually, a while. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes. And so if um, when we would like you to speak with the microphone, because this is being streamed, and there's a lady right here in the middle. In the middle? And then one was it? Yeah, right here. Right here. Um, one thing you don't mention about uh, the decrease in war since 1945 was the uh, the effect of the bomb Not after Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Uh, yeah, so I, I think just... a lot of you know people are afraid to have war. So it is one explanation that I, that I did not mention, and, and Professor Welsh probably has an opinion on this as well. I do discuss in, in both my books, The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now, the, the nuclear peace theory, the suggestion that one person made that the, no, that the nuclear bomb be given the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, <laughs> So it is an idea. I, I don't think it's actually that plausible as an explanation for a number of reasons. One of them is just even theoretically, the World War II was so massively destructive in, in Europe that uh, no one was eager for, for a rematch. Even just conventional artillery and bomber aircraft and uh, tanks could do plenty of of, of um, mutual destruction that meant that uh, that there was a big incentive for heavily armed nations not to get in each other's face again anytime soon. Also, if you, nuclear weapons are so indiscriminately destructive, they're so milit almost militarily useless that they actually haven't been much of a deterrent in actual uh, conduct of wars, other than the, the doomsday scenarios of. Uh, all-out surprise attack. There have been many cases in which, contrary to what one might expect if, if it was the nuclear weapons that kept the peace, you'd often have a non-nuclear power that would actually uh, declare war on a nuclear power. And that shouldn't happen. Uh, but uh, the reason it did happen so often is that nuclear weapons are so massively destructive that they're effectively a bluff. So when, when uh, Argentina uh, uh, conquered the Falkland Islands from Britain in uh, 1982. Britain was a nuclear power, Argentina wasn't. But they just knew that Margaret Thatcher wasn't going to render Buenos Aires in, uh, a radioactive crater. Uh, when Sadat invaded uh, Israeli-held Sinai Peninsula in 1973, Israel was a nuclear power, Egypt wasn't. When Saddam Hussein defied the United States, he didn't have, have nukes, but he knew that that America wasn't going to bomb, uh, wasn't going to nuke uh, uh, Baghdad. So it's, uh, it has been argued that the post-war period would have unfolded in exactly the same way if nuclear weapons uh, had, had never been invented. And I, that, that, that's the side that I, I uh, come, come down on in, in uh, Better Angels. Do you have comments, Jennifer? Just to say, I think the, the problem with the argument that nuclear weapons kept the peace themselves is the logic that some then apply to that, which is to say, well, then all states should have nuclear weapons and we would be safe. And I think the reality is that the deterrence that underpinned the, the post-1945 order was of a very particular kind, and particularly between the United States and the then Soviet Union, um, there the particular distribution of nuclear weapons did play a role. I think one of the more worrying features of our current environment is that a lot of the agreements um, around nuclear weapons, I'm thinking particularly of the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement in Europe, um, which is now under serious, um, it, it's seriously being questioned uh, by, uh, by both sides and any chance of a new START treaty, I think those trends are very, are very worrying. Uh, and we also have the, the question of um, how particular states who would like to acquire nuclear weapons would use them more as a bargaining chip than necessarily in the, in the, heat, of, uh, in the heat of battle. Okay, there's, yes, 
Thank you very much. Thank you for this very stimulating conversation tonight. One thing I observed was that much of what you discuss actually relies on the technicalities of what we define as war. Political scientists or lawyers in the field would talk about 1,000 battle-related deaths. And so there's a big difference between a hot peace and a cold war. And even the proponents of the democratic peace theory today would say that we're entering into a second world war. So I think that some of these questions right now are, you know, are, are being discussed quite hotly in the field. But what I'm interested in is what's happening next. We're in a field now where we're talking about cyber attacks, artificial intelligence, about situations where technology is really changing the nature of warfare, where we're not dealing with you know, soldiers on the grounds, boots on the grounds, but we're dealing with situations where people are not in the same geographical space. I mean, are we as a society, as the UN Security Council, ready to deal with what happens next? Jennifer, would you like to comment on that first? I think these are excellent questions. I mean, one of the most striking um, shifts, I'd say, of the last 15 years is that a number of Western states who used to have um, democracy promotion as key parts of their foreign policy, it was a key pillar of their foreign policy, the United States, but also Canada and others, are talking increasingly about the defense of democracy at home. And what that means is partially what's happening internally with our populations, but it mostly means how are we going to protect democratic processes from foreign interference. Um, and I think that is a very uh, striking uh, turn. Now, we could ask ourselves, how new are some of those threats? There's always been espionage, and I actually think we tend to downplay old-fashioned traditional espionage. It's still alive and well, and what I mean by that is human beings as spies. Um, they are still part of the uh, repertoire of states. But I do think these kinds of threats uh, do pose particular challenges. I'm not entirely convinced that they create a new universe. I would say that an organization like the UN Security Council struggles um, to deal with threats that are not more traditional threats to international peace and security. So there, they may be less prepared to deal with issues such as um, cyber attacks. But if you look at what international lawyers have done, they very uh, deliberately and systematically tried to think through, f through products like the Talon Manual, which tries to regulate um, are thinking about cyber attacks. What would this mean? How would we think about imminent threat? What would we think a proportionate response should be? We may not necessarily need to change our legal and ethical concepts. Maybe we do uh, in some instances, but I think we should be careful about throwing everything out, assuming that this is a revolutionary challenge. Because in some cases, some of those notions may still serve us very well. I also think the powerful idea of reciprocity, which has always fostered cooperation among countries, will come into play here. Reciprocity meaning we agree to certain rules because we want them applied to us just as we want them applied to others. And it's through reciprocal agreements that we make each other all better off. So we are in a phase where, a lot, where this seems like it's the Wild West. Um, but I think there has to be and will be uh, efforts to try to regulate that space as there were in the past efforts to deal with new technologies. And remember, the longbow used to be the weapon of war, right? We've had technology changing the way we confront each other as societies uh, over the centuries. And so technology itself um, is not the problem here. We've always had to deal uh, with that challenge. It's what the particular uh, novelty of some of this is, is I think the question for today. Would you like to comment briefly and then yeah. we're going to take one more question and I'm I mean, going to move geographically over here. Well, certainly if war shifted from, you know, the, the Luftwaffe bombing uh, London to some Russian bots spreading propaganda about Hillary Clinton, that even that would be progress. And probably the, as, as reprehensible as the Russian attempts to interfere with the American election were, they probably did not flip the election or even have much, much of an effect. Uh, it is certainly something that we ought to, that the 
country ought to safeguard itself against. But as, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, the United States and many countries have been at uh, with espionage interfering with one another's elections for, for many decades. So it's not, I don't think it's a fundamentally diff different um, uh, kind of warfare or, or, or equivalent to the warfare that has been reduced. Okay. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I have a question about the heritability of hatred and all of its guises, uh, misogyny, radicalism. One can imagine that in an earlier time, xenophobia yeah. had a Darwinian function, but it's everywhere and it's here. And uh, is it closer to your mouth? Oh, Closer, closer to you. Oh, no, no one can hear. No, that's good. Anyways, it's the that close, heritability it's good. of hatred, and is it, uh, what, what makes it persist? Yeah. It seems to be ubiquitous in pockets, magnified by the internet. Does it have Nature, any? nurture, uh, shows, yes. And, and what is its remedy? Yeah. Okay. Well, this, this is exactly how I came to this entire topic, which, uh, as a psychologist, a topic that, that uh, I was certainly not, not trained in, uh, dealing with the question that given that evolution uh, moves slowly, it has a speed limit measured in generations, does the possible existence of hatred, xenophobia, sadism, dominance, vengeance mean that we're doomed to war forever, uh, as in kind of the, the lazy expression, well, you, you, war will always be, be with us, you can't change human nature. And it was precisely in order to push back against that rather f gloomy, fatalistic conclusion uh, uh, in an argument that I made that agreeing with you that these really are parts of human nature, contrary to the uh, opposing view that we're just blank slates, that uh, the environment just gives us all of our desires, uh, which I thought mistakenly had been equated with a progressive position. People had thought that we should hope and pray that humans have no aggressive instincts because that would make it easier to bring about world peace. And if we did have any aggressive or, or xenophobic tendencies, then we may as well just uh, live with war forever. I came to this whole area by saying, well, no, that, that doesn't follow. Just look at, there can't be a debate as to whether the amount of violence throughout history is pinned at a constant level because of human nature. The data just show violence has gone down. So whatever is in human nature, it isn't something that dooms us to perpetual strife. So how is this possible? Well, it's, uh, th that is that uh, human nature can exist, as I argue it does, but that rates of violence can go down. The answer is that there's a lot in human nature. There indeed are these xenophobic tendencies. There's tribalism. There, there's, uh, there are forms of, of uh, racial distrust. On the other hand, what the mind category, categorizes as a tribe is pretty elastic. Uh, it, it Probably for a lot of human history, it was your own clan, your own blood relatives, and the next village over was fair game. Then it became the, 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 the tribe and the nation. And uh, we can try to make it all of humanity. Uh, and have that be our, our, our tribe. Even if we have a tendency to lash out in violence, we also have self-control. We can count to 10, we can hold our horses, we can save our money for a rainy day. Uh, we have empathy, we can be brought into the lives of other people and then not see them as just uh, subhuman enemies to be eliminated, but people just like us, but you know, there but for fortune, that could have been me, and so I'm not going to uh, uh, wipe them out with, with impunity. Uh, I uh, summarize this idea by borrowing the lovely phrase from Abraham Lincoln, the better angels of our nature, which beautifully captures the idea that human nature comprises many angels, some of them better than others, and that what can change over history is that our norms, our institutions, can empower our better angels at the expense of our, our, our inner demons, our nastier self, our dark side. And Jennifer, would you like to have the last word? That's a challenge. Uh, I'm someone who has studied genocide and crimes against humanity for much of my professional uh, life as an academic. So when I hear your question, I think of those particular instances which are the most extreme uh, forms of xenophobia. And 
when you look at some of those instances, um, it's difficult to generalize, but there are good studies that look at risk factors and help us understand when those types of violent situations are, are going to unfold. Um, you see that ideology is often a big factor, uh, that people are motivated by particular ideas. I think if we step back from that extreme specter of genocide to something that we see that is perhaps less um, threatening, the xenophobia, racist attitudes, there is, I think in our current society, a tendency which is manipulated by some political figures to scapegoat, to think about one's own relative position, and then to try to find a scapegoat. Uh, and even though one's absolute position <laughs> in life may be better, uh, in society may be in an absolutely better position, there's a sense of where we are relatively. Uh, and when those who have political positions encourage us to reflect on our relative position, there can be a natural tendency to scapegoat. I think we see that particularly in Europe where I lived uh, for almost two decades with respect to refugees, uh, refugee populations. Um, and that I think is a modern, although perhaps not new, uh, phenomenon that we are seeing um, that is a product partly of uh, economic factors, but also of cultural factors, uh, that people feel threatened and therefore point at scapegoats. Okay, well, thank you all very, very much, and please join me in welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, so I really want to thank you all for coming here today and uh, on behalf of Miguel I want to offer you these gifts. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so I wanted to say a few words. Um, uh, so thank you, Mark, for mentioning the McGill Alumni Association of New York. Uh, so I'm the president, Yasmin. Uh, so we host several events throughout the year, and I wanted to tell you about our next one. Our next one is a similar format to this. It's McGill Talks. It's happening on June 3rd. Uh, so the invite went up and everything. So please check our website. It's manny.co. Uh, manny, it's M-A-A-N-Y dot co, not dot com, dot co, actually. It's like the modern website name. And it's going to be, uh, we're bringing in two uh, McGillians who are in the health tech field. Uh, one is from Capsule, uh, which is a very prominent company in the healthcare field right now, and then Quartet as well. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting panel, and then with light networking similar to this event. Uh, so yeah, otherwise we have a lot of events throughout the year, networking events and happy hours and stuff, so um, definitely make sure to subscribe to our mailing list and uh, keep an eye on our Facebook page and everything. Uh, but yeah, I'm like, I would like to thank you again for coming tonight. This has been a really fascinating talk and I'm sure we all really enjoyed it and we have a lot to reflect on, so thank you again. Thank you, Colleen. And I really hope that both of you come to the library. I've actually oh, yes. been a couple of times already, but I'll come and visit you. Please do.